Okay, today we're going to sum up Uncle Tom's Cabin, which we talked about in the previous class, and then we're going to move into the notion of modernism, which is a, a mindset, a philosophy, and a movement that really defines pretty much everything we're going to do this semester. So to sum up Uncle Tom's Cabin and how it operates in terms of the mythic and the illusionistic, we certainly see in Uncle Tom's Cabin a higher power, God, Christianity. We certainly see the smallness of human life. Um, you know, I mean, certainly we don't get quite as much of the smallness of human life. Individuals do matter, but by and large, the individuals in Uncle Tom's Cabin matter to the greater issue of slavery rather than as, as individuals themselves. And we certainly see connections to greater things. Again, heaven, uh, the final scene with, with uh, our deceased characters happily up in heaven with God is a big part of it. Um, connection to greater things like, again, slavery, like morality, like bigger issues. Uh, and in Uncle Tom's Cabin, we also see the illusionistic. We have a happy ending for everybody, even Uncle Tom, who has the saddest ending, like we said, ends up in heaven. We have a clarity of purpose for almost every single character. They know what they're supposed to be doing, and those who don't have a clarity of purpose uh, get one. They learn one, right? Topsy is... Uh, shiftless and immoral, and she learns to be good. Um, and Ophelia really thinks Topsy is a savage, and she learns that actually she's not. She's a real person, etc. And I would say overall, <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin is significantly more beautiful, exciting, interesting, clear than your real everyday life. So in many ways, Uncle Tom's Cabin is operating in both the mythic and the illusionistic notions that define a lot of 317. There are also some ways in which it isn't, though, um, and we, we talked about this in class a little bit, that it is politically progressive, that it is proactive, that it is trying to go out and change the world and change specific political issues. Now, it's not doing it in a very good storytelling manner, but it's trying, and that's a step away from a lot of what was going on in uh, Theater 317. So... We're going to skip the discussion question because we'll talk about that in class. But uh, to sum it all up with regards to melodrama, remember, guys, melodrama is all about spectacle and action, right? Big, exciting, action-oriented things happening, uh, large stage machinery, basically, right, not a lot of complexity in terms of what's going on. It's heavily based in emotion. It wants to grab your heartstrings and squeeze them and, and make you feel rather than really make you think that much. Um, simplicity, there wasn't a lot of complexity. There aren't a lot of in-depth, complex characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin. There aren't a, a lot of uh, um, complex storylines. Everything's really straightforward. And one of the nice things that results in for the creators of Uncle Tom's Cabin is popularity. And popularity means money. Lots of people want to go see this play because there are clear delineations between right, wrong, good, and evil, and there is not much gray area in the play. And so we get that notion of clarity, and that's one of the things that a popular audience, right, a broad audience generally likes. I don't necessarily, as a popular audience member, want to go see something that complicates or confuses my worldview. So Uncle Tom's Cabin gives us clarity, and by the end it gives us closure. Everything is wrapped up. Uh, and so <laughs> what we're doing here fundamentally is talking to an audience and mostly affirming their worldviews and their beliefs. We're going to spend a lot of the rest of the semester running away from all of this stuff here. There will be different places um, in modernism, in, in uh, sort of modern storytelling, both realistic and anti-realistic storytelling. Uh, there will be different places where we still use some of this stuff, but by and large, we're going to get rid of it and chuck almost all of it out the window. So just kind of keep in mind what melodrama did and what Uncle Tom's Cabin did, these things on the screen here, because we're going to spend a lot of time doing some very different kinds of things. So what does this all have to do with the Industrial Revolution? Um, massive advances in the seven, beginning of the 1700s, um, but really picking up steam in the 1800s, um, picking up steam is a Terrible accidental pun. I really didn't mean to do that. But, right, we talk about in the bottom right here, uh, or sorry, in the bottom left here, we've got a, an early steam engine, which allows us to power factories. We have uh, um, all kinds of, right, in the middle, we've got steam locomotives. We have the development up in the upper right of canal systems. Uh, this is a Bessemer oven, which allows us to create iron uh, and steel, which is more efficient and lighter than iron. And we have all these amazing advances in technology, agriculture, factories, just basically across the board, and especially in the 1800s, during the time uh, leading up to um, most of what we're going to be studying this semester, the Industrial Revolution changes the face of the world. It has some negative cultural impacts, um, massive and sudden urbanization. Uh, over the course of, again, especially the 1800s, we have tens of thousands of people who move from the country, where they were on small plots of land farming, 
to the city where they are now bar by and large working in factories and they make a little bit more money than they did in the country. And a lot of those country farms are dying out uh, in this era because industrialization means that the individual family farm goes away. Um, so, and again, you know, I've got a lot of negative stuff on the screen here and it is really negative. You look at the slums in the, of London in the upper right hand corner there, you look at, I mean, this is a one room, um, a one room apartment in which a family of like eight or nine lives, no windows, tenement apartments. The cities were basically not equipped for this massive and sudden influx of country people moving into the city. And so you get, right, in the upper left-hand corner, air pollution, we get all kinds of child labor. I mean, kids in this era started working at like 11 or 12. And by working, I mean uh, Monday through Saturday, 70, 80 hours, 90 hours a week, making almost no money. It's borderline slave labor to keep this giant industrial machine rolling. Now, there are benefits to this, right? By and large, goods um, get cheaper, so more people can buy things. Uh, the quality of life overall does generally improve a little bit. Uh, transportation improves your ability to go see other places and to sort of experience the world. Uh, communication, things like the telegraph uh, and newspapers, allow you to learn more about the world. So, I mean, the good side of the Industrial Revolution is you can buy more high quality goods for uh, cheaper and you learn more about the world. Basically the world gets a little smaller and your world view gets a little bit bigger. The negative cultural impacts here are pretty apparent that it's a uh, um, especially on the large majority of people who are in the working class uh, the Industrial Revolution has some pretty negative effects so it's a mixed bag. But one of the things we get to with the uh, Industrial Revolution is one of the results is thinkers, social scientists, actual, right, uh, hard scientists, um, you know, people looking to change the world and make these um, elements of human suffering go away. There's all kinds of activism in this era. People start studying the world in that very Age of Enlightenment mentality, right? And there's a clear connection between Age of Enlightenment and um, modernism. So we get people who are being proactive about rights for people, we get unionization, we get science studying to uh, make the world better, we get social science, we get you know things like uh, um, charities, things like government supporting, uh, providing a sort of social safety net for the poorest to some degree, right? So it's a very problem-solving oriented uh, mode. Now, right, I'll ask you this question then, what is theater Right? If, if modernism, if this modern uh, era is coming around, if the Industrial Revolution is happening and lots of people in the modern era are trying to change the world, well, let's take a look at the mythic and the illusionistic and say, what are they doing about any of the problems of the world? Well, they really aren't. I mean, Shakespeare is wonderful and beautiful, but a lot of people in this era make the argument that Shakespeare elevates you into the higher plane and makes you learn and think about amazing, tragic, epic things or happy, easy, funny comedies. Well, what does that do for me if I'm suffering? How does that change my individual uh, life if here I am living in this little tenement apartment with no windows and seven or eight people in one room? Um, the, the sort of human misery that results from the Industrial Revolution isn't really touched by a lot of the mythic and the illusionistic storytelling. So, this is where we get into the notion of modernism. And now, what we talk about with regards to the modern era, this begins in the mid to late 1800s. Um, what we try to do is define the spirit of the time. The German word for this is called Zeitgeist. And any era has a Zeitgeist, right? So, um, for example, the Zeitgeist of uh, the American 1960s, right? The spirit of the 60s in America, especially the late 60s, the Zeitgeist was one of revolution and massive uh, uh, sort of democratic social change. We get the civil rights movement, we get the, um, um, the sort of sexual liberation of America, we get the feminist movement happening as well. So if I were going to sum up like the zeitgeist of the 1960s, it would be revolution and change. What we're going to do in the next couple of slides is try to sum up the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time of the modern era, of the late 18, mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. So when we talk about the spirit of the time, uh, or that zeitgeist, again, those words mean the same thing, we're going to start with the four big guys who shaped that modern zeitgeist. Um, and there are lots of other people we don't have time to include here, but these are sort of the four most relevant individuals who define the notion of modernism. This first gentleman is August Comte, um, and he lived from 1798 to 1857. He came up with the idea of positivism. And if you think back to Theater 317, all the way back at the beginning, 
We talked about the notion of cultural Darwinism in 317, and that is, the, that is exactly the same thing as pos positivism. And Comte was a social scientist and a modern thinker who looked at societies and noted that they move in a consistent line from simple to complex. And he said, we need to look at different societies at different eras, and rather than looking down on one society and, and favoring another one, we need to have some level of relativism, where we respect and appreciate different societies at different points in their evolution. And he noted that there are three stages of man, or three stages of society, um, of modes of thinking, through which every society moves. And he, looked at, he claimed to look across the globe and say, I can notice, you know, let me explain to you what this civilization is um, and what these three stages are. First, he says, every society begins in a theological state. That is, they believe in gods or a god. Right, um, and, and primarily a society in this early theological state of thinking explains the world through divine intervention. Whether it is the Greek gods who assigned every natural phenomenon to a god, right? Apollo carries the sun, Zeus, thunder, lightning, etc. Um, or even the most sort of quote unquote primitive um, tribal cultures in which nature oriented gods are sort of common and, and a way again to explain everything. Or, from a Christian standpoint, the notion that one God created and, and controls and masters everything. So Comp says that is the most basic and the first stage of, uh, of human existence, the theological mindset. Then societies advance beyond that theological mindset, or they at least add to it, and they develop what he calls a metaphysical mindset. And then, so this metaphysical stage in the development of human societies is really about the idea that we value concepts that exist outside of any set religion or set of gods. One example of a metaphysical mindset would be the notion that there are essential human rights. Right? I mean, think about that idea. What's a human right? Well, there are all kinds of them. And societies at different points, specifically, say, America at the time of democracy, said there are essential human rights that just exist. They're just facts. We don't ascribe them to any religion. We don't, we don't say, well, obviously it's written down in the Bible that here are human rights. Um, these metaphysical concepts become the second stage of the development of any society. Um, human rights, justice, freedom, equality, right? These big nonspecific concepts that exist out there in the world, uh, in the universe, but that, that aren't necessarily associated with any hardcore specific religion. So, we go from theolo theological, belief in gods, to metaphysical, belief in sort of abstract but necessary ideas. And then the third and most advanced stage of man is the scientific stage, where now we start scientifically investigating things and we can prove, for example, that democracy is the best way to run a society. Or we can examine the way in which nature works. And we can understand that actually, no, it is not the rain god that makes it rain. We can study the clouds and weather conditions and fronts and all that stuff, changes in temperature, and we can understand how the world works scientifically. And obviously, Comp says, theological is the first one. It's the most, quote unquote, sort of primitive or basic. Metaphysical is a big step forward. And then scientific is the most advanced state of any society. So when we come into the next class, I want to make sure we kind of touch on these three stages and make sure you get what Comp is, is getting at, because this progression is in one way very, very true, and in another way really sort of problematic and causes a lot of um, European and American people to be really superior and uh, kind of arrogant, but we'll come back to that, right? Um, here's another guy in the first entrance, uh, entrant into our facial hair contest, which will dominate all of the images of uh, thinkers and playwrights and historical figures throughout the semester. This is, of course, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, as you know, wrote on the origin of species by means of natural selection. What Darwin did in that book is, obviously, right, we talk about evolution as being a key notion to Charles Darwin, but I want to shift it away from just simply talking about evolution and focus on Darwin's study of two specific aspects that determine who we are, who animals are. Again, Darwin's writing about animals. Other people later took Darwin's ideas and applied them to humans, but Darwin says, if I want to know why an animal is the way it is, I need to study its heredity, what were its parents like, and its environment, in what world did it grow up in. And in the modern era, one of the uh, sort of cornerstones of that modern zeitgeist is 
to scientifically study and examine the world and to look at humans. How do we get where we are? Well, I need to study heredity, look at my parents and who they are, and I need to study environment, where I grew up in. And this is a radical shift in the way we think about people. Again, um, as we talked about in class discussion, most of the world in Theater 317 tended to say, ah, heredity, environment, whatever, it's about what you were born into. It's about the class you were born into, and that's pretty much it. So heredity plays into it a little bit, environment not so much. Now we're considering these things as a field for study, as a scientific investigation, that, that one of the ways we can understand the human condition is by examining people's heredity and environment. All right, so the two-tone facial hair entrant here is none other than Karl Marx. He's our next major thinker. And Marx, as you guys know, wrote the Communist Manifesto. But rather than just thinking about Marx as being pro-communist, he certainly was, we're going to think about Marx from a historical standpoint. So Marx says that the number one thing that determines the course of history is not religion, is not nationality, is not the will of an individual king to go conquer some other king. The number one thing that determines the course of history is economic factors. Marx says, you want to know how history unfolds? Follow the dollars. Every single thing that happened, argues Marx, in the history of humanity may claim to be based on something else. Again, right, nationality, religion, what some king wants. But in fact, Carl says, nope, it's all about money. If you want to examine the most essential quality then of an individual, I, he doesn't care so much about race, he doesn't care about gender, he doesn't care about nationality. He says, if I want to understand who an individual is, what he or she wants, and where he or she comes from, i got to understand that individual's social class. What class is he or she a member of? That will be the primary defining quality. If I'm going to study the history of larger groups, it's not about the French versus the English. It's not about the Catholics versus the Protestants. The way Marx studies groups is we study... Uh, uh, history is an, as a conflict between the exploiting and the exploited. The exploiting are always the upper class, the monarchy, the landowners, the entitled people who have all the money and the power. They are demographically in the minority. There aren't very many of them. And then the exploited are always the working class who have no money and who basically have to work to survive. And therefore, the exploiters, the rulers, the upper class have all the control and, but they do it, they gain that control and that power on the backs of the vast majority of the working class. And our last guy, appropriately holding a cigar, Sigmund Freud. Now Freud comes along a little bit later. The interpretation of dreams is until 1899. Again, we're, we're sort of in generally the second half of the 1800s here. Um, but the key thing that Freud brings to the table here is the notion of the subconscious. The idea that um, there are things going on inside your brain that control your actions that you don't know about. And that's kind of a shocking revelation um, in terms of the way we think about how humans uh, view the world and perceive the world. The idea that there's something going on inside of you, inside your brain, that you're not aware of and that you can't really control. And that we walk around the world with these forbidden desires, that there are things that we want that we can't have that cause all kinds of sort of psych deep psychic and psychological problems within us. Uh, and that's a huge part of Freud's thinking here. And so in order to study human motivation, we've got to actually get down to what is going on inside an individual's head. But what's important here, guys, is that Freud says human motivation is not up to the individual's choice. Basically, the whole theory of Freud's psychology is the things you do, you don't do them for the reasons you think. You do them for reasons that are unaware, or that you're unaware of, and you can't know about. Um, and so that's again, that's a pretty shocking thing. God doesn't tell you what to do. It's not the that religion leads you to a direction, and it's not individual choice that leads you to a direction. It's this notion of the subconscious that leads you through your life. So if we sum up the modern zeitgeist, then right, what do these four guys all add up to? Um, what are what is the spirit of the time of the modern era? The big deal here with modernism and the modern zeitgeist, right, the spirit of the time is this notion of the scientific method, asking that question. How does the world work? How do individuals work? How does social class work? How does heredity environment influence who we are? And the scientific impulse to understand those things and to investigate them, right? So our, our thinkers here are investigating the mind, the economy, right, all, all the things that we just talked about here. And then the second part is not only do we want to understand how things work, but we want to create a proactive approach to these things and ask, how can we change? How can we improve? How can we make these things better? 
Um, and each of these guys has some suggestions, right? Um, both Comte and, uh, to some degree, Darwin advocates social study as a study of societies. Marx <laughs> advocates revolution. He says the working class should rise up and overthrow the ruling class. Um, psychoanalysis, Freud says, lay down on my couch and I can explain to you what that weird stuff is that's going on inside your head. I can explain to you why you're doing what you do in a way that um, other people can't. And then obviously, right, if we study in a Darwinian sense, the heredity and environment of individuals, maybe we can change that environment a little bit. Maybe we can make people's lives better by changing the environment in which they live. The modern zeitgeist, right? Modernism as a way of thinking, this notion of the scientific method and then a proactive approach damages a bunch of things. This notion of romantic idealism that we talked about with regards to uh, romanticism, with regards to a bunch of other sort of uh, uh, ways of thinking, there isn't a lot of idealism in this. This is just hardcore scientific practicalism. All oh, this notion of good and evil that we saw in Uncle Tom's Cabin and that we see in melodrama, good guys and bad guys, I didn't see any of these people that necessarily say that there are villains and heroes in the world. So this notion of melodramatic absolutism, eh, it's kind of thrown out the window, right? Certainly, religion takes a big hit with all four of these guys, right? It's not God that shaped the world. The world is just shaped a certain way, and by scientifically studying it, we can understand it. And we also get rid of this notion that there are absolute right and wrong answers to things, that instead we just study and we keep studying and we keep digging and delving into depth. And all four of these gentlemen destroy satisfaction with the way the world is. They say, instead of just being satisfied with the way the world is, we got to go out and change the world. We have to fix it. We have to make it something new and different. And so those especially who aren't in power lose a lot of satisfaction um, with the way in which the world exists. So as you read Ahead of Gabler, tell me how and why it qualifies as a work of modern theater. In what way do we see Darwin, Marx, Freud, and Comte in the play? In what way does this play... Ask the questions, how do things work? In what way does it advocate an open-ended, complex, proactive approach to seeing the world? Because those are really important sort of keys. So keep that stuff in mind, and um, I think that'll conclude the lecture for today.